So thank you very much for having me. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be back. And um, what I've been starting to talk about, and some of you might have seen former talks of mine, is I really hate false positives and like wasted time in security operations. So this is what I've been focusing on, and I've just published another paper together with Aaron Leverett. And uh, this is going to be the main focus today. And um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cesar Sacha Boldevin. I am Swiss. I moved to Germany um, four years ago now almost. And I have been working in IT security for um, plus 16 years now and like 10 years or more in the financial industry especially. And I have been working in many engineering positions. And like based on all of that experience, I'm now creating those documents and processes and hints and things too and KPIs. That's pretty much what it came down to. And right now I work for Finance Informatik, which is an IT service provider um, for all the German saving banks. So the Sparkasse, where you can see that logo, they most likely get the infrastructure provided from us for that. So I pretty much start every of my talks with this slide, because why am I doing this? I um, really want to create sustainable security. And I know this is, has become a real bad buzzword, but uh, um, I want to create intelligence processes so people learn while doing the job. Because I've always been told by managers that uh, they learn on the job, but really, if you don't have to stuff around so you can guide them the right way, they won't learn things and not efficiently, and they will burn out before that. And you want to have efficient workflows and detection capab capabilities because really when you look at the world and how things are going, you don't want to waste any resources. So intelligence processes, why? Guide junior analysts to think the right way, to learn to ask the right questions because that's really the main thing. You need to learn to like what is the right question that you want to ask. Um, why the efficient workflows prevent bore out and blunting of um, the employees and the optimal use of the internal resources really because I mean they, the board is not going to give you more money to put in more infrastructure if you can't show them that the stuff that you're already having you're using the right way. And um, this is pretty much the same thing. You want to have efficient detection capabilities because you really don't want to waste any of the resources you get. It's like um, John already said in the opening in the keynote, it's really hard to get the money at the first place. So you want to show that you're actually making good use of that. And I'm... What I'm doing is I go through the like all of the security operation tasks and analyze what is going wrong there and like try to abstract that and put that into frameworks and um, like this is what I'm presenting on here and I really want to build this into the process and we're going to go into that in the details now um, but uh, that's what I'm doing or trying to do differently. Now, today we're going to be talking about threat management and especially vulnerability management. And the question really is, no, no, not really, it's do we have a problem? And if you've seen the news lately, you might be agreeing with me that actually we do, but um, it really depends who's asking because some of the top management, they still try to play it like it's not a problem, even though we have co like so many articles coming up with... Um, Things are not patched. People don't know how to patch the amount of systems that they're having. And um, they're really just, like a few weeks ago, was this new CISA report, or like really cool um, summary of um, weak security controls and practices and what you should be doing instead and like how to improve things. So um, what I can suggest, and this is just for a basic, I want to be uploading the slides afterwards to my GitHub as I usually do, so you don't need to like need to save it now, but uh, this, these are really interesting reads. And what you can see is um, we really have been and have had a rise of vulnerabilities and it doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon, especially not when we have like more devices that we need to cover up with like all the OT stuff. So um, yeah, we really should be doing something about that. Now, to start from the beginning, um, as some of you might know, I'm an architect. So what I currently do mostly is pretty much I design slides for managers so they understand the problems from the techies and I create the processes around that. So this is what we're going to be jumping into. Um, the simplified process for threat management really is you want to analyze. When you have a new potential threat, um, you want to have some kind of system around that is analyzing is that threat relevant? Is that a problem to you? If yes, you have a new vulnerability that you need to be like treating in a way. And if not, um, then you most likely either um, it's not applicable to you, 
because you have some measures in place that are going to protect you from that threat, or you don't use that software at all. So um, that's pretty easy. So what are the requirements that we can actually do this job? First, we need to have a defined risk acceptance values. So most companies do have these in place. These are these boring guides where it says that a patch should be installed in 30 days or less. Or, um, and if it's higher risk, then it needs to be faster than if it's a lower risk. And you need to have those things um, defined pretty well. And you need to have a guideline on what is an acceptable, ac acceptable risk and what not. And that can be really interesting because some companies really, you see, they put numbers behind what they are actually like accepting to be charging and w what they like see is like a low value or if they have like for example I, I always like the dimension if it's just local news then it's just a minor problem but if it's global news as if your small company might ever make global news then it's a big problem and um, so they have really interesting scales on how they measure this already. What you also need, if you want to decide on if the threat is relevant, you need to have that inventory of all software products in place. And we're going back to the keynote that um, John just gave. I mean, we need to have the basics. And we're coming back just with the first assessment already. We need to know this. And if we don't have this inventory, it's going to be a hard task to do. Um, the third stuff really is inventory of protections applied per target system. And this is going to be really interesting because that's going to be really um, flexible and changing and adapting to like what is, this is really the stuff that's changing all the time and it's really hard to document in a way so you don't document things twice and you don't forget stuff. Um, and now if we know that we have a vulnerability, um, you have this predefined distribution process for if the vulnerability is relevant and uh, you're going to be like, this is in most companies, the vulnerability is then assigned to the system team that is actually responsible to that system. So um, if they say, now uh, that's at least what I've seen like in most companies that I've been working for, um, is that... Uh, uh, if they say they have this detection and they, the team says no, it's not relevant to us, then you usually either have a faulty vulnerability verification setup or the context of the exploitability has not been given. So this is like when you have parameters in place still and harden the system at all, so it, it can't be exploited. But if it is um, vulnerable, we're getting to the interesting stuff. Um, you want to know, can it be prevented on time? And preventing on time usually means patch that system. And um, if not, then I'm just going to make a small excursion now. Um, we, you want to check the possible courses of actions. And the, you have actually either actually the active security measures, and if they are possible, you want to document the risks for that and apply the active measure. And if not, you want to apply a passive security measure. Now, I'm um, first finished teaching that, um, the predefined distribution process. So you can have this in place in your company. You need to have the correct responsibles identified and like in that CMDB related to all of the, all of the software that you're using and everything. So already finding clear responsibles can be a challenge. The second stuff is that find specifications needs to be actionable because prevention on time really need, means that the teams that are getting the tasks that they should be doing something, they need to know what they can do and what is like in their measures and, the, and possible. So you need to have these things in place beforehand. Then point three is, is active security measure possible? Um, the next steps really need to be clear. You, they need to know what are all the capabilities. And if they don't know what other security measures you have in your company, they m most likely are not going to be reacting to it the right way. And um, <laughs> what really is helpful is if you actually have a working vulnerability detection setup. So um, if you're scanning from the right place, for example, if you're not like blocked out from firewalls, that can be really interesting if you're outsourcing your stuff and you're depending on another company who needs to deliver your information. You need to have the information to be able to control those things. So um, these are just the necess necessities. And um, now for the courses of actions, for those of you who didn't hear about that for, uh, already, um, that's pretty much, I've learned that in the threat intelligence training by Sons, a little shout out to sponsor. <laughs> and um, so active courses of actions are deny, degrade, disrupt, deceive. So deny is, um, for example, if you really block the connection, firewall block or ACL. Degrade is if you have a queuing or quality of service in place, you degrade 
validating it, so it can't happen in a way it should, uh, the, the attacker is planning to do it. Disrupt is if you can really take it out of working mode, so stuff like antivirus, data executive prevention, intrusion prevention systems, and deceive is like a honeypot or a DNS redirect. And um, the destroy option is the one that usually is not working for private companies because um, the legal measures, that's what you might be doing eventually in the end, but that actually an attacker is taken down during the attack does usually only happen on state level. And the passive actions are the detection itself. So you have your EDR, you have your intrusion detection, AV, Sysmon, whatever you use to detect what is happening on the devices. And discover is the hunting afterwards and discover with searches and CM and EDRs. And for those who want to know more, there's a great paper by Lockheed Martin um, who's describing all of that and how all of these techniques map to the cybersecurity kill chain. So you pretty much start to like identify what are your deny possibilities um, for every of the cyber kill chain phases. And uh, so this can be really cool to get an overview on what is your company already capable of doing and what is might be missing. And the general suggestion is um, for critical or high, you want to at least have one active security measure and a passive action. And um, for medium or low, I would suggest this pretty, this, this come from me, so... Um, please feel free to see that this could be like more riskier in your company and you need to do other things, but uh, at least one active security measure and if not possible to resolve on time. And this is what I want to be focusing on, apply a passive action. Because in my opinion, if the security management and uh, the risk management team is defining and telling you, you need to have patched things in 30 days, um, if you can't hold that 30 days, you already are at that risk. And you want to be making sure that you measure everything against that because this is what they're expecting you to do. And if you can't confirm to that what you're, they're expecting of you, this is when you should be getting money to improve things. So here again, the overview. And now comes the challenge. Why can't those patches be installed on time? And um, this is what the newest paper is really focusing on and going into details. And uh, what I do suggest is that these categories that I'm um, highlighting now are implemented into the vulnerability management process that you have. So if you have those uh, vulnerabilities distributed to your teams, um, you want them, if they can't install the patch on time, grade why they can't grade it, why, why they can't patch that system yet, and, or what they can't patch of those systems. And um, so we're going to go into the details now about that. The first reason you most likely hear most often is they have resource problems. They have are low on staffing. They have other priorities, most likely availability, and they just don't get the resources to be actually able to like maintain all of the system that they need to do. Now, if you have this problem, or if that other team does have that problem, you want to really. Um, document the resource assignment because if you start to like make a wind on what is going wrong in your company, they will be coming back to you and they want to see proof that you really are not having enough resources. It's um, horrible with management, but that's just how it is. And you want to, as a technical team, uh, so if you are the, the Linux admins as well, um, you want to document what patches were not installed on what systems because this is really what is helping you afterwards telling what actually is the risk of that. And you always, always want to file a risk entry for the relevant systems and patches not installed or for resources not being permitted. So you want to create a document, a document trail like John also mentioned before because those risk entries that you file are going to save you ass if your company is ever being breached and everyone is going to point at you and you can say, I told you so, we documented it. You management didn't give me the resources I needed to. So really make sure that you have a process in place where everyone knows that their next step, if they can't follow up with that, and I know how many risk countries this is going to be creating, um, but uh, documented stuff. What cannot be patched on time? Because else management won't get the transparency to be able to decide what they should be actually be deciding on. So suggested KPIs, because my goal really is um, create KPIs out of that. I'm starting to be nasty, uh, because if I'm going to come up with a report and show that for those around, those are systems, we can't install the patches because of there, there we have resources problems, there's the X and whatever, and we create this visibility, we have the facts. 
And with those facts, we are able to convince people and show why we actually need to do more things. So the suggested KPI is a um, number of delays due to resource problems and or the average number of days delayed due to the resource problems. So this, this is something that I would suggest that you track. The second reason why patches are not installed on time is uh, the compatibility problems. And this is usually when they have something old running and they have a dependency on that and they say, if we now patch that system, our software product that is actually our product to our customers is affected by that. So they won't be able to run the business service because of that patching. And of course, then the business service does have higher priority. But that's not something that the technical team can resolve easily. Now, the possible actions for that is you actually, that's more work. You need to initiate a project to update and redesign the affected solution. And that's usually money that it needs to be involved. So it's, it's good that you document it, that you create your document trail. What is going wrong there? You, I think I have this covered everywhere, but file a risk entry for the relevant systems and, um, especially uh, for deprecated systems still not being switched off <laughs> because as much as we shouldn't, we all know we have those systems. And um, connect the risk entry with the delayed patch if only um, comments. So it's just transparent on what kind of systems are not being able to like be standing up to our requirements that the security management and risk management is giving to us. So the suggested KPIs, number of delays due to compatibility problems, and number of filed risk entries for deprecated systems. I would be pretty hard on that. Now, the next reason, bad SLAs. And that has been the one that I've been like pondering about the most, I would say. Um, because what I've seen is, I don't know how many of you are working in like network security, because you might be the ones that know this the most. Um, but you usually have this um, goal to be patching in 30 days. And if you have a centralized uh, change management and incident management, um, you most likely will maybe have patch times like two times a year. So please tell me how, if you just are allowed to patch your systems in six months once, um, you could ever fulfill those 30 days. I mean, it's just not possible. So these are kind of things, and this is usually because we have a contract that is telling that um, our customers have like an availability from 99 dot something percent, and this is why we only have these low patching times. And another of the reasons is because the architecture doesn't allow to single out systems and do failovers the right way. So um, the next steps really, if you want to create like make this change, because this is um, already starts to be more political. Um, you want to have in your company the high impact security flag for your urgent changes. I've, this is pretty much best practice, but just make sure that you have that. So those teams don't have the excuse that they can't install the patch on time. Um, you want to document the number of patches needed to be installed per change window. So they have an overview on what you're doing because else they will be like coming back to you and saying you're not doing your job. And you want to influence the change team when change windows are planned. So you know that you actually are able to like supply from that requirement that you're given. And escalate and file risk entries for bad service design in regards to SLA commitments. So this is really the political one. And I'm sure that the managers here need to like take this. This is usually not the one that the analysts can resolve themselves. But, um, and you want to be like, like counting this. You want to be sure that it's not just one time that it occurs, but it's more like a systematic problem. I think that this will best help you to actually make changes. And um, yeah, the KPI really is number of delays due to unreasonable SLA. Now the fourth one, the support problem. <laughs> The specific product version installed doesn't have support anymore or um, you have um, components that has not been fixed in your original issue. So, I mean, you probably saw, saw that all with um, Log4J that your products that you had, that you had the source code of, you could fix yourself. But then you had, of course, another company with their own product and it took them forever until they supplied the patch. And this is stuff um, that is really afterwards showing up in your process that, and the thing is really, for some reason, management, when they see vulnerability management, they look at a CDC or the SOC for to blame. And the CDC is usually just a 
place that is actually driving all of these tasks to do, but they can't do the changes. They're just documenting the state of the company. And so you want to be making sure that you can show those dependencies. Now, for possible actionable next steps, document the number of patches system affected, update, update the process for partner evaluation, because if this happens too many times from the same company, you might be checking if you want to be making further um, business with them. I mean, this usually is not really liked, but if, you, but if you create the facts and create the statistics and document it, how often it actually creates a real problem and a risk for your company because of that, you might have a, a chance on actually changing something. And really escalate file risk entries. And uh, this is usually also where high management likes to present themselves with. So this is something that you can perfectly create slides for and like send them to the, call, to the partner and make sure that they can fix this stuff. Um, for the suggested KPIs, number of delays due to missing patch by partner and average number of days delayed due to missing patch. Now, the parties involved, we have the operational technical team. So this is like the Unix engineers, the Windows engineers, Active Directory team members, and the security operation centers. And we all really work with a different perspective. And now to go into more details, what are these perspectives? Um, the focus for the operational team usually really is uh, or should be create transparency for the management and take the lead in the communication because they are the ones that should be doing the changes. You as a SOC, you have to re report the patch delay, what is like in your process that you're responsible for not working well, and advice for patching prioritization. What is risk is created if the patch is not installed? The parties that you're like talking to is CSO legal risk management, security management, supply chain management, and IT service management if you have those in, like really in your company. Now, what are they caring about? The CSO legal risk management team, their real focus is, do we get a contractual problem because of this? Is the risk management already covering this? Do we need to report this to customer and top management? This is the view that they have on this. And for you, they really are the last point of escalation if nobody else is, has been doing stuff. And the language that you need to be talking to if they, if nobody else was listening is these customers or customer services are affected. You need to be showing them the facts. This is why every of the team should be documenting what are the affected systems. And this is why you should be having this inventory on what is actually affected in the background. Um, security management. Is this affecting our compliance reporting? Because what they really are focusing on is they have their framework that they say that they like focus on and they define their controls and what should be done. And this is pretty much all that they care about. Do we have controls for this? And are these controls and the actions defined they're being followed? And ensure all occurring security and compliance challenges are treated in an effective manner. This is what they are caring about. And from a really global perspective. Um, so what you should be showing and highlighting to them is that a certain customer service or business service cannot be upheld if state A occurs. Now, for IT service management, um, this is the interesting part because that's the internal discussions that you're going to be having. This is change management, incident management, problem management, the asset management that you should be having. Um, they have a focus, and this is to provide a business service. And um, so what you should be doing is really um, par show what is like going wrong there and really bring in this perspective and show we can't provide this availability if the service um, is not like patched. You need to show this, how it's connected to the business service. And if you can connect this vulnerability to that, they need to react on it, else file risks. For supply chain management, this is interesting. This is the work with partners. Um, uh, the focus, you hopefully have a team doing that, and you don't need to do that yourself, so you can have this centralized. But uh, the focus there really is, do our partners deliver the needed services and useful to us way? And the role is to unify and coordinate dependencies to contractor partners. And um, so... If we have not a strong enough SLA with a partner or they're not upholding to that SLA and what they have been contracting to, this they need to know because else you will always get that same supplier again and again just because they were golfing with that other manager and they're not going to be solving your problems. 
Um, so make sure that you document that stuff and so you actually have a chance to do something about it. So that was the first dimension. That is the stuff that I covered in a paper. And I have had a lot of discussions lately recently and about what are the other problems why those patches are not installed. And the stuff that I've just, you've just seen is the things I believe is doable and manageable from a technical level. And the stuff that you're going to be seeing now are the more political problems that you might be having in the company. And um, so this is why they're not in the main paper yet. I actually want to create a blog post about that still. I have not been coming to that yet. So here's the presentation first. It soon will be out in a blog post as well in like details. But um, we have things like organizations and people from that perspective. You're long-term understuffed or you have the wrong skills in the team. You have from the information and technology perspective, no working standard installation and deinstallation routines. So the people in the technical teams don't know what they should be doing. Your value streams and your processes from that perspective, you have missing or bad software governance process. So when is something running out of support? When needs to be, it needs to be removed? Um, so this is like scheduled and uh, managed from a governed perspective. Um, and for partners and suppliers, you have bad supplier management and partner have been out of support. So the partner is not even there anymore. They can't even give you a patch for that. So the bigger your company, the older um, systems you have, the more likely it is that you're actually running in such problems, into such problems as well. Now, the central parties stay the same. Here are the parties that you need to be talking to. There are human resources, security management, BCM, architecture management, and IT governance, if you have those parties in your company. Um, human resources. The question really is, do we have the right skills on board for the direction we want to go as a company? And the role for them should be recruiting and retaining the right skills aligned to the company strategy. If they don't give you the right employees so they can solve the problems, um, you should be telling them, our employees, employees need to understand X and training Y to be able to correctly assess C. Um, security management or BCM, really. This is, you need to shift their focus on the business continuity part. When are they needing to like supply for, um, perhaps even regulation, um, that they're able to do their job? So the focus is, is this affecting our compliance reporting? Are there contract controls that define the responsibles? That's still the security management part. Um, but this customer service cannot be of hold if state A occurs. You need to show them what needs to occur, what is this, and then risk management can do an assessment and say, okay, this might never be a problem at all. But then they've documented it, and you're safe. You need to be making sure that you've reported it, else it's become, gonna become your problem. Um, the other problems or the other parties that you want to be talking to is architecture management. Um, architecture usually is defining the governing structures, like what are the frameworks that we are aligning to, what are the defaults that we want to be upholding to, and those structures, they need to be in place so um, and followed in, in like hardening your system since this benchmarks, you want to be having like a NIST recommendation, for example. I mean, whatever you want to use for you, um, it can be COVID. Uh, just use what your architecture feels like, but the language you need if you feel like they are not doing their job is the software product does not fit into the current process because, or there is no governing process for to solve problem X. And with IT governance, um, can we identify a responsible to solve problem X? Because governance is really about, they should be knowing who's doing what role in that company. And if there are certain problems that you can't find a contact person for, you have a governance problem. Um, so they need to assign responsibles in company and make sure all topics are covered. And the language you need is, in this occasion, team A is not responsible for product B, who needs to assist with solving X. It's pretty simple, but uh, yeah, I think the hardest part will be to actually get their attention and uh, to get it um, like 
be talking about, but it's their job to make that assignment. And it's not you as a SOC or as a blue team to be doing all of the details. You need to be learning how to play with all of the other members in the company to be actually able to resolve the problems that we are facing. Now, for the possible solutions, and I'm focusing here pretty much on technical stuff, and um, don't I didn't like to do much research on that, to be honest. But um, what you've heard, heard buzzwords about is, for example, containers. So we all have heard about Docker. Um, my thoughts on that is that you really need to have sure, make sure that if you want to be tearing down your systems regularly, up and down, you need to have a good testing framework around. You need to have like tests automated and all of your services that you are deploying, um, you need to have that automated. So it's actually something that requires quite a lot of maturity. And if you're fighting with asset management, this will not be the right solution. It can be something you work towards, but you really should be getting your um, whole basic straight before you move on to further things. For automated patch installation, um, this is also fastening things up. If you faster have all your patches distributed, things will break faster. So this is also lots of um, testing, and you need to know those dependencies. If you have all of the same kind of systems, the fleet that you are pro like providing to, this can be done, but really make sure that you have... Um, you're not patching all at the same time, but uh, have like windows and things, so you might not be getting that speed that you need to. Virtual patching is an interesting thing that I've been hearing about lately. It's pretty much AV solutions that's saying that they will also prevent you from exploits of whatever. And it really depends on how much you trust your AV provider, I guess. And um, this can be possible if you can't patch a system. But usually the systems you can't patch, um, they most likely also don't accept AV on their systems. I'm thinking about mainframes and things. Um, the last thing that has been buzzing around is streamline your IT processes to threat-driven vulnerability management and or risk-driven. And this pretty much means that you need to have that inventory set up and based on an inventory and what business service is running on what system and ha is having what security measures already in place, you then decide that you prioritize what is like having the highest risk score and uh, like most likely to be exploited first. So all of the links that I provide here are no endorsements. I've just wanted to have it or make it easy for you so you could read on on these things. And you should make those decisions yourself if this can be a solution for the problem you're facing. In my opinion, if you're having resource problems, going towards some of the things can be helpful, but only if you have the required basics in place, really. And management need to understand that, that they're not going to be making your life easier if they're going to like confront you with another problem. And that's what they're doing if they bring in another environment for you. Now the benefits, the KPIs. <laughs> um, this is a summary and um, I hope nobody's going to ask me about the endogenous and the exogenous risk because that's pretty much what uh, Aaron Leverett were brought into the paper and the talk that we were giving at first. So he was explaining that at the first talk that we gave into an E20. So you can go back to that. It's just a 20 minutes video, also linked in the GitHub. Um, but um, here we have the number of delays due to unreasonable um, SLAs. And you really want to have zero of that. And um, this can be, this is like the contractual problem. This is really a business problem. If you can't do the jobs you should be doing because of the contracts that you're having to other companies, this should be raising awareness that you should change the architecture you're running so you're actually able to do that job. And um, it's an exogenous type of risk. So if I've understood it right, it's like an external risk that is coming towards you. Um, number of delays due to resource problems or the um, of delays due to resource uh, the average um, if this happens too often, it can illustrate how your stuff management is impacting the quality of security services. So this is really the resources things. You also want to have that pretty much to zero um, because your teams should be actually able to do the stuff, the job that they should be doing in the right way. And if they're having resource problems, they're not. They're just solving fires and they will never be able to do the stuff with the care they should be doing it. It's a contractual problem and it can be both coming from inside and outside. 
number of installed patches on time. This is the main thing that the management has been interested in so far. And it should be above 80%, I would say, or more. It really depends on what your risk management team is giving as a goal to that. And um, yeah, the installed patches coming from outside. Number of blind spots identified. That's actually a reference to what is also in the paper because um, it, the paper also goes to why can we not get the lock when we needed to. Um, so um, when the, the security the operation team wants to get the lock into the CM and there will be eight different versions of why they can't connect those locks to the CM and why this is not going wrong. But if you have such things, systems that can't deliver the locks, file a risk entry, and this is going to be a blind spot because this is a system that you can't monitor and you want to make sure that you got documented. Yeah, and you want to have this number really low. And number of context of exploitability not given, that comes from the threat process that we've seen at the beginning. Um, this can be really interesting because if you have very high numbers of that, um, it's very likely that the teams are not being honest with you and they just don't want to do their job, which will certainly cause very different problems. But uh, it's always good if you actually track that so you can see a comparison and how it changes on, uh, over time and how it changes with different teams. So make sure that you actually look after these things. And it's, again, an extremist risk. So what are the lessons learned that we have here? Analyzing, for me, never is a binary thing. You, for every problem that we have in security operations, there's never a black or white solutions. There usually are very specific problems occurring, and you need to be talking to the other parties to understand those problems so they are able to treat it the right way, because usually they don't. They don't know what, who they should be talking to, what they should be doing now. They just know that something is expected of them, and you are the security advice position in a technical um, level, so they most likely be coming by you, and so it's good to consider that there are different options that you could do. I mean, you've seen the courses of actions before. It might not always be possible to do the deny and like patch the system, but if you already put a WAF before the system, it might be helping for your attack. And if you have another thing you could be doing, this is basic security architecture stuff. There usually is something that you can do to degrade the problem. Now, the next thing really is the standard IT service management processes are the foundation. And we can't say this enough because it's too many companies and management is blaming it on the security people and it's not the security people that are doing the stuff wrong. It's the basics that are missing for them. So start highlighting and tracking where are your basics missing? Where didn't you have the assets or the responsibles for that? Start to track that in your processes. All of the things that are published, I see as a minimum that you should be doing because it's always easier to add things than to take away. And if you feel like in your company, um, you should be tracking another value as well. Start tracking it. Start making sure that the, on, the teams that you're working with understand that problem, and then they also start to track it. Because the more numbers you create for it, the more statistics you create about it, the easier it is for you to afterwards convince management that there's something that you should be doing about it. And um, that's in regards to the solutions. Understanding the problem is fundamental to do actually apply the right things. You've probably had management coming around with, let's do DevSecOps, let's do all containers and things. And um, this might be good for you, but only if you have the right problem matching to it. If you have other problems, like missing inventory and things, then you might be focusing on that first before you do such a big step. Or just move anything into containers and do your asset management then, if that is working better. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so my call to action really is request the fields to be added to your platforms. Build them in if you can do that yourself. And create the data to document your pitfalls. Document what is going wrong in uh, your company. And so you have the data to make the changes and make sure that it's not your, you that are blamed in the end, but that you can actually get the right parties involved to solve the problems. So if you have any further questions, I'm also reachable on, on Twitter. And um, I have all the documents available on my GitHub as well. So how are we with timing?
<laughs> we are pretty good on time, so we have time for questions. And we actually got one on Twitter, so I'm going to start with that. Yes. Um, what about uh, other peers like project management, IT architecture, building new depths for wool management? This is from Sasha. I think you touched on that, but maybe you can expand a bit or recap. And in the meantime, we're going to mingle with the yes. crowd and take yeah. other questions. I mean, talk to them if you know that the project is already working to that. It's, it always depends on how this is like included in your company structure. I mean, this, this is coming from the part where we have the basics and need to add on more. If, if you're talking to project management, it depends. Do you have a central structure in your company that is um, actually analyzing where the gaps are to develop your company strategically? If you do, then you can be start, like talking to such a department. If you just have projects popping up in every technical team to solve their technical problem and you don't have a global structure that is like trying to get an overview over that, it's very hard for you to find the right entry point to that. So, um, yeah, you should be trying to talk to those, but always make sure, like John also said in the beginning, map it to the business service. Map it to what is the impact of what you are doing here. And, um, yeah, try to resolve it this way. And, it, I mean, honestly, if you file risk entries, <laughs> risk entries are the things that security management needs to go through. And based on that, strategic projects should be started. So if you have those risk entries in place, it should be popping up, else they're not doing their job right. Awesome. Thanks, Desiree. Uh, do we have more questions in the room? Please raise your hand so I see you. <laughs> I think we have one back here. Okay. Yeah, so I'd like to know, um, have you seen organizations where they have the risk appetite to just take systems down? I mean, if something is vulnerable and publicly reachable, maybe unauth, something like that, just saying, well, that thing is vulnerable, we don't want to be exposed to that, turn it off, and make the availability the problem of the IT owner. Have you seen that? Well... It happens way too often, I would say. So, so if I understood that right, just to reflect on a question, um, have I seen that if there is this problem and it's not going to be getting patched, is it still a problem for the management or do they not see it as a problem? I guess the question is, um, at what point do you give offensive teams or operational teams just the takedown? Listen, turn that off. That, that really depends on your how you are making the decisions in your company. If I would usually take the one who's responsible for the business service because he needs to be standing up afterwards for it. And if you don't have um, specific responsibles for that, then it's going to be a governing management position, maybe even from the board. So um, usually always you should be having a business responsible um partner for that or a uh, responsible person and you should be talking to that person and they need to decide. If they accept the risk, if they are too afraid of taking it down and patching it, then the only thing you could actually be doing is like suggest other measures from the courses of actions, like degrade something else or uh, at least like uh, raise de the de 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 detection level on the systems. So you, if it is exploited, you can like isolate things in the background or make sure that you actually see what is happening and then you can still report on it. But that's what I would suggest doing if they really don't want to be taking it down. But, uh, they need to know. And cybersecurity has been in the, in the news lately quite a bit. So it's very likely that they don't want to be the one that is afterwards responsible if your data is suddenly somewhere in the internet. Does that help you? Perfect. Wonderful. More questions. Maybe more as a comment. Uh, what I normally see uh, on organizations and maybe touching on what the gentleman said right now, uh, is that normally these business owners, they don't understand the security risks. That means not patching. Mm -hmm. And you also are asking uh, security professionals to deal with other teams that also don't understand. Uh, I mean, because there are many different levels of patching. There mm -hmm. is Windows patching, application patching. Now we even have IoT mm -hmm. devices around. So the core problem I normally see is people don't understand the risk. And even if you have a skilled guy to try to teach them, still doesn't fix the issue. So, I mean, I know that you kind of addressed somehow mm -hmm. how to do it, but I mean, 
how really can you cope with so much of these that I don't know. I mean, it's difficult to put it into words, right? But it's all about the data. What is actually happening on the systems that are at risk? Because if the data that is there, if this is suddenly in the internet, if this is a problem to your company, if because it's like customer information, credit card information, even or um, your source code or something, then you will have like a higher risk. And this is when I would escalate to a CISO. Um, if you don't have that, it's still the business service responsible that needs to decide on it. And if it's just like your sys like front end, like your website, but nothing critical on that, and you don't have it connected to any background databases or something, you might in worst case just start to clone it and like, like build a safe backup that you will eventually put in place or something. So you could just make the switch. Um, but it doesn't need to be that you need to be patching that one system if this needs to be reliable, but that this is what you could be if the risk is high enough, then be starting doing instead. So I would just try to find ways on how you can meet their goals. So for them, it's availability for their service and try to find a solution so this will be not be compromised or as little as possible. So you don't have perhaps a downtime for of two hours for the patching, but instead just to switch over to the other system, which will take five minutes or so. This might be more able for them to accept. Good. Awesome. Do we have more questions? How are you all doing up there? I'm not going to run up there, but if you raise your hand, you can shout it out and I can repeat it so we have it on the video. No? All right. Uh, I think we're out of questions then. So thank you very much, Desiree, um, for your presentation. Please. <laughs>